filming a 100 vehicle chase in the desert, reshooting an entire film and keeping up with Tommy Wiseau's weird demands. Making any film is challenging, but some truly stand out. We heard you loud and clear in the last video about wanting more, so we returned with another 11 of the most difficult films to make. Just like the others, most of these are highly ambitious projects that quickly made directors realize they had bitten off more than they could chew. These are films that took decades to complete, led actors to lose hair from stress, or even involved someone drugging the cast and crew's food. There are plenty of contenders for the title of hardest film to make, but be sure to check out the last video for an additional 12 to help you decide which film deserves the crown. First up, we've got one of our favorites here at Filmstack, Mad Max Fury Road. Released in 2015, director George Miller actually thought of the idea for this film back in 1987, just two years after he released Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. It wasn't until the early 2000s that they were committed to making it, with Mel Gibson set to return as the lead and Sigourney Weaver as Furiosa. They had even begun constructing some of the vehicles for the film. However, they encountered a major setback in 2001 with the 9-11 attacks in New York, causing the American dollar to plummet relative to the Australian dollar, thus inflating their planned budgets. The film had to be shelved and Miller went on to direct the next closest thing, Happy Feet. During the wait for the next Mad Max, it became much harder to envision Gibson as the lead. He was getting old and had a lot of controversy attached to his name, so Miller needed to find a new Max. There were also plans for an R-rated animated Mad Max film around this time, but those were dropped. Finally, in 2010, Miller was ready to move forward with Fury Road as part of a two-part series with Mad Max Furiosa, casting Tom Hardy and Charlize Theron as the leads. In 2011, we finally got Miller's long-awaited sequel, Happy Feet 2, before he went off to Namibia to film Fury Road. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know how intense it is. The entire film is essentially one massive chase scene and almost all of it was done practically, with CGI only used to enhance landscapes, weather, and remove unwanted things from shots. They filmed for six months in the desert, constructed 150 vehicles, and employed over 150 stunt performers, including some from Cirque du Soleil. Nearly everything you see in the film is real, including the fire shooting guitar. They shot the film chronologically, relying on their 3,500 panels of storyboards because the script contained barely any dialogue to follow along with. This left some actors questioning Miller's vision and feeling lost, especially Hardy, who later publicly apologized to Miller for his initial frustration with the film until he saw the final product. Despite the challenges, the film received rave reviews, won six Oscars, but didn't perform exceptionally well at the box office. But fortunately, its success was enough to greenlight the sequel, Furiosa, with Miller returning as the director. Fingers crossed that it's going to be good, though it seems to rely a bit more on CGI than Fury Road did. For our next toughest film, we've got the first summer blockbuster, 1975's Jaws. It was the first major film shot in the ocean and served as a warning for any directors who were thinking of doing the same. Steven Spielberg was only 27 years old when he directed the film and had a $3.5 million budget and 55 days for filming. They opted to build mechanical sharks for the film instead of training real great white sharks, an actual suggestion by one of the producers. However, these mechanical sharks posed one of the production's biggest challenges because they weren't built to withstand the salt water of the Atlantic Ocean. This led to their unreliability and unusability at times, inflating the budget by about $3 million. To address this, the script underwent many revisions to reduce the shark's on-screen appearance, but this actually improved the film's suspense. Spielberg later claimed in interviews that the malfunctioning sharks turned out to be a blessing, giving the film a more Hitchcock vibe. They endured many 12-hour workdays, spending only four hours on actual filming and the rest on fixing issues. A platform towing shark models capsized. The main boat in the film began to sink with the cast and crew still aboard and sailboats in the distance kept showing up in their shots. Cameras constantly got soaked and actors often got seasick. Spielberg blamed these issues on his perfectionism and his belief that he could control the ocean and that although he could have filmed in a tank, it wouldn't have captured the same look. Tensions also ran high between actors Robert Shaw and Richard Dreyfuss, who argued all throughout production. Shaw's struggle with alcohol only made things worse, where he got on everyone's nerves the moment he got drunk. The film's budget skyrocketed to $9 million, and its planned 55-day shooting schedule stretched to 159 days. After filming wrapped up, Spielberg said, I thought my career as a filmmaker was over. I heard rumors that I would never work again because no one had ever taken a film 100 days over schedule. However, his worries were soon laid to rest as Jaws proved to be a monstrous success. Critics praised it and it became a massive box office hit. It had a major impact on the industry ushering in the blockbuster decade. But I can't help wonder how things might have been if those mechanical sharks had worked. Continuing with movies filmed on water, we have James Cameron's Titanic. 
It's one of the most ambitious productions ever, with a near full-scale replica of the ship built, over 1,000 people on set, and Cameron himself who earned the nickname the scariest man in Hollywood for his intense way of directing. Back in 1995, Cameron made 12 dives to the actual Titanic in a research submarine to gather footage for the film and gain a deeper understanding of the tragedy. Filming kicked off in July 1996 with a hefty $110 million budget and a 138 day shooting schedule. Unlike Jaws, they opted for a 17 million gallon water tank to shoot the ship's exterior scenes. But even before filming on the model ship began, they hit a snag. While shooting in Nova Scotia in August, the cast and crew ate some seafood chowder, only to realize something was off about it. People started tripping out, rolling around, hallucinating, and forming conga lines. Cameron managed to vomit before the full effects hit him, but over 50 people ended up in the hospital. It turned out the chowder was laced with PCP, sparking a full-blown investigation, though the culprit was never found. When the new set in the water tank was ready, that's when the real fun began. Cameron was commanding up to 1,000 extras and 800 crew members at any given time, unleashing his inner dictator. He was described as a 300 decibel screamer and poor Kate Winslet was genuinely afraid of him. There were many 20-hour workdays and the crew often fell ill with colds, the flu, or kidney infections from being in the cold water for so long. Winslet even suffered hypothermia, chipped a bone in her elbow, and nearly drowned when her coat got snagged underwater. Three stuntmen ended up with broken bones from a single stunt, and atop it all off, there were no bathroom breaks, so they resorted to peeing in the water, making the tank's water filthy in no time. Cameron felt the heat from the studios as the budget ballooned to $200 million, making it the most expensive film of its time, and the filming days stretched to a whopping 160. To make matters worse, all their issues were very public in the paper, with a daily Titanic watch column and variety following along. Many expected the film to flop, including Cameron himself, who famously said after editing, I just realized I made a $200 million chick flick where everyone dies. What the hell was I thinking? I'm going to have to rebuild my career from scratch. But as we all know, things turned out well, with the film earning rave reviews, sweeping the Oscars, and becoming the highest grossing film of all time. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> Until Cameron's avatar came along to dethrone it. Now, let's move on to another film that was made more difficult because of the director, but for completely different reasons. The Room. This cinematic disaster has been dubbed the Citizen Kane of bad films, and let me tell you, it's probably the best, so bad it's good film. You gotta tear me apart, Lisa! Despite being universally panned, it gained a cult following over the years, and the story behind its creation is as entertaining as the film itself. Written, directed, produced, and starring Tommy Wiseau, The Room started as a play before Wiseau decided to make a film out of it. Its $6 million budget was funded entirely by Wiseau, with no one really knowing where he got the money. He claims he got rich importing leather jackets from Korea, but who knows? Now, this movie had no right being a $6 million movie. It's just about his fiance cheating on him with his best friend. But Wiseau's bizarre creative choices really inflated the budget. Instead of renting equipment, Wiseau decided to buy his own complete beginning director package that came with both an HD camera and a film camera. Not knowing how the two differed, he decided to film with both at the same time, using a contraption to hold them together. Each camera had its own crew assigned to it and the shots differed slightly because of filming from different angles. In the end, only the 35mm shots made the cut. Then there's the filming locations. Rather than shooting on location like most productions of this type, Wiseau opted for a rented soundstage, even for those rooftop scenes. And let's not forget Wiseau's struggles with his own lines. Basic scenes took days to film, with countless takes and plenty of dubbing in post-production. How much is it? It'll be $18. Here you go, keep the change. Hi, doggy. The original script was a disaster in itself, somehow the final product being the best they could salvage from it. But the one thing Wiseau insisted on keeping was the infamous getting out of bed naked scene, because as he puts it, I have to show my ass or this movie won't sell. Filming took four months and over 400 people worked on it because Wiseau often replaced the crew. My favorite fact is that when the film did terribly in theaters and it was going to be pulled, he paid to have it play at one theater for two weeks so it could qualify for an Oscar nomination. Or when he spent $5,000 a month for five years to promote the film on a highway billboard even though the film only played in theaters for two weeks. His friend and co-star Greg Sestero wrote a book titled The Disaster Artist that goes over the making of this film and it was adapted to film under the same name. Definitely worth checking out. Back to more serious territory, we have 1977 Sorcerer, directed by William Friedkin. Now, Friedkin is no stranger to difficult filmmaking, just take a look at his previous film, The Exorcist and its cursed production. The film follows four men transporting unstable nitroglycerin across a jungle and it has you on the edge of your seat for most of its runtime. It's super stressful. 
it took 10 months to shoot, mainly in the Dominican Republic where they encountered most of their problems. While filming in Jerusalem, a stuntman was injured when explosives detonated too close to him, only for Friedkin to request another take an hour later. While shooting a car crash scene in New Jersey, it took 12 takes over 10 days to meet Friedkin's satisfaction. The final take involved driving the car off a ramp and flipping it to achieve what Friedkin had in mind. Throughout production, about 50 people had to leave due to injuries, gangrene, food poisoning, and malaria. Even Friedkin contracted malaria, resulting in major weight loss. Tensions were high on set, especially between Friedkin and the lead actor Roy Scheider, who Friedkin believed had an inflated ego because of Jaws' success. Friedkin pushed Scheider and the other actors to their limits, where they even did a lot of their own stunts. Scheider said they were rehearsing to stay alive and that filming Sorcerer made Jaws look like a picnic. The production faced its greatest challenge with the iconic bridge crossing scene, where a truck traverses a flimsy looking wooden bridge. It took three months and $1 million to construct the bridge, with assurances from the locals that the river's water levels would remain stable. However, the river dried up completely, forcing them to dismantle and relocate the bridge to Mexico. Unfortunately, their bad luck continued as the new river dried up as well, so they resorted to practical effects to simulate flowing water. After many months and $3 million spent, this single 12-minute scene was finally completed, but not without the truck falling off the bridge a few times. Also, while they were in Mexico, some crew members had to leave the country due to drug possession, so replacing them caused even more delays. My favorite fact was that they had guards around the bridge 24-7 to protect it from locals who were threatening to destroy it. The superstitious locals believed the bridge caused the river to become shallow. The initial $15 million budget shot up to $22 million and the film performed poorly at the box office, with some attributing its failure to releasing soon after Star Wars. Although it received okay reviews upon release, Sorcerer has since garnered a lot of praise. You know what's more difficult than making a film? Having to make it twice, and that's what Andrei Tarkovsky had to do with Stalker. After spending a year filming all the outdoor scenes, they discovered that the footage was unusable. The problem came from using a new type of film that Soviet labs weren't experienced in handling, so they didn't develop it properly. This incident only worsened the already strained relationship between Tarkovsky and the cinematographer Georgi Rurberg, or however you pronounce it, which led to Rurberg getting fired. Tarkovsky wanted to abandon the project, and the Soviet film board wanted to shut it down as well. However, Tarkovsky managed to persuade them to turn it into a two-part film to secure additional funding, and his proposal was approved. With a new cinematographer on board, Tarkovsky went on to reshoot the film. The film follows two men being escorted to the zone, an area that's supposed to grant their deepest desires. And while this next part I'm about to talk about didn't make the film more difficult to complete, it's still very important to go over. Initially planning to film the zone scenes near an old Chinese mine, the location was unusable due to an earthquake that destroyed it prior to filming. As an alternative, they opted to film near two deserted hydro plants along a river in Estonia. The new area did come with some drawbacks. Upstream from their filming location was a chemical plant that discharged poisonous waste into the river. A scene in the film even captures the unsettling sight of white foam on the river and what appears to be snow falling, despite it being summertime. Not long after filming, several crew members involved with the production fell ill, with many connecting it to the shooting location. Tragically, this included Tarkovsky himself, who passed away in 1986 at the age of 54 from cancer. And although Stalker was never actually made as a two-parter and its initial release garnered mixed reviews, it has over the years become a contender for one of the greatest films ever. To lighten the mood a bit, let's take a look at one of the best examples of actors making a film far more challenging than necessary, with 1986's Crawl Space, starring none other than Klaus Kinski. Director David Schmoller even released a short film in 1999 detailing his experience working with Kinski. We'll make sure to include a link in the description. The film has Kinski playing a man who runs an apartment full of secret passageways, hidden rooms, and torture mechanisms. Schmoller had no idea of Kinski's reputation for being difficult to work with, but he was about to experience it firsthand. Even before filming started, Kinski threw a tantrum over wardrobe issues, insisting on purchasing his own attire and billing it to the film, only to keep it all afterwards. By the third day, Kinski already initiated six fistfights with crew members, causing numerous delays. Schmoller and the producers were eager to drop Kinski early on, but the distribution company paying for the film insisted on keeping him. However, one of the producers came up with a rather unconventional solution to their Kinski problem, to kill Kinski for the insurance money. Horrified at the mere suggestion of such a solution, Schmoller told another producer about it who responded with a casual bummer. By the fifth day, Kinski had caught wind of their attempts to fire him, prompting him to make things even more difficult. When Schmoller called out action to begin a scene, Kinski erupted in a fit yelling, action, 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 all my life, directors yelled action. action. 
They mutually agreed to substitute it with Klaus instead, but a day and a half later, the same tantrum occurred. Klaus, Klaus, Klaus. All my life, directors have called Klaus. And when questioned about an alternative, Kinski simply replied, say nothing and I'll start when I'm ready. Fed up with his behavior, crew members began whispering to Schmoller, please kill Mr. Kinski. The same tantrum repeated itself later, this time over the word cut, with Kinski saying he'll stop when he's finished. Kinski also refused to deliver lines he didn't like, resulting in some scenes not making any sense. Unsurprisingly, the film received terrible reviews. Stanley Kubrick We can't do a list like this without including a Kubrick film, and yet we didn't include one last time. From filming with only natural light, to his absurd level of production design, to his precise style of directing that has the cast and crew go insane because of it. And what Kubrick film shows this spiraling into insanity more than 1980's The Shining? After being disappointed with Barry Lyndon's box office numbers, Kubrick decided to adapt a Stephen King book due to the author's popularity and his own interest in exploring the horror genre. Kubrick is very meticulous. Every detail in every scene of his films serves a purpose, like how he insisted on the war room table in Dr. Strangelove being green, even though the film was shot in black and white. And The Shining was no exception. The iconic elevator scene took only three takes, but each setup took nine days. The shot of the tennis ball rolling towards Danny required 50 takes. However, the most notorious example was the scene with Shelley Duvall backing up the stairs with a baseball bat, defending herself against Jack Nicholson. It took 127 takes. Kubrick believed Duvall wasn't selling the terrified expression, but in reality, she was genuinely afraid of Kubrick and his relentless demands. He basically bullied her the entire production, often to the point of tears, criticizing her acting ability and how she was wasting everyone's time on set. Apparently, Duvall became physically ill because of it and even experienced hair loss due to the psychological abuse. And to add insult to injury, she received a Razzie nomination for Worst Actress, which feels unjust considering what she went through. Nicholson described The Shining as one of the most challenging films of his career, albeit for different reasons. The script underwent daily changes, prompting Nicholson to stop reading any scripts provided to him and rely on learning his lines minutes before filming a scene. And due to Kubrick's meticulous style of directing, filming stretched over a year to complete. Despite its success at the box office, The Shining received mixed reviews. Stephen King was also disappointed with how much the film deviated from the book. However, over time, The Shining has garnered a lot of praise and is often considered one of the best horror films of all time. We're also going to squeeze 2001 A Space Odyssey into this spot, a film that has us wondering how the heck was it even made in 1968? No CGI. Everything you see was either physically or chemically done. Models ranged from 2 to 55 feet long, rotating sets and mats and had 12 people working over a year to finish. Filming alone spanned nearly two years, followed by an additional two years to complete 205 special effects shots. While the original $6 million budget increased to $10.5 the film more than recouped its cost at the box office. However, it's a tragedy in the film industry that the only Oscar Kubrick ever won was for visual effects in this film. Our next film, Richard Williams' The Thief and the Cobbler, shows us the issues with being overly ambitious. Technically, it's an unfinished film. It was released with different edits of whatever was completed under the title The Princess and the Cobbler and Arabian Night. The film's production dates back to 1968, with a team of 40 working on it by 1970 under the title Nasruddin. In 1971, Williams released an animated short, A Christmas Carol, which won the Oscar for Best Animated Short, providing momentum for his Nasruddin project. However, despite having three hours of animated footage complete, the project was abandoned due to alleged embezzlement by the producer. But Williams was granted permission to use the characters for future projects, leading him to spend the 70s writing a new script. The project was sidelined in 1974 when the studio faced financial challenges during a recession, shifting their focus to TV commercials and shorter projects. Those involved with the film just penciled in animations until they'd get more funding. Williams continued to hype the project over the years, labeling it as an epic and saying he's aiming to create the best animated film ever. He aimed for a fully hand-drawn animation running at 24 frames per second, double the industry standard of 12 frames per second. In 1978, Williams secured $100,000 from a Saudi prince for a 10-minute test scene. And Williams being Williams, he selected one of the most challenging scenes, which ended up costing $250,000 and they missed the deadlines, which caused the investor to withdraw. To help get funding, William directed the animation for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, earning two Oscars in the process. This helped him get backing from Warner Brothers, and the production on Thief and the Cobbler started in 1989 with a 1991 deadline. 
However, the scenes were ridiculously complex, especially at 24 frames per second, which meant double the workload for the animators. And Williams didn't storyboard the film, so there were issues with the plot's structure and repetitiveness. He also animated more than what was needed with the intention of cutting stuff out afterwards, which is a ridiculous approach to animated films. The production faced brutal 60-hour work weeks and high turnover rates, with Williams even firing employees on the same day of hiring them. Unsurprisingly, he missed the 1991 deadline and the rough cut he showed to Warner Brothers wasn't received well. They brought in others to help salvage the film by adding additional scenes at 12 frames per second, removing repetitive scenes and transforming the film into more of a musical. The released cut of the film received mixed reviews and underwhelming box office numbers, but over the years, a restored version of the film has been praised a lot, especially for its complex animation. Our next film is the definition of development hell, and it's Terry Gilliam's The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. Despite being released in 2018, it's been in the making since 1989 with many failed attempts. The first attempt came after Gillian read the novel it's based on, prompting him to sign a deal in 1990 with Phoenix Pictures to make the film titled Don Quixote. However, the budget that was offered was too low, so Gilliam left the project. He was replaced with another director, but the film ended up getting scrapped. The second attempt was in the year 2000. It was now titled The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, and Gilliam secured $32.1 million in European funding and would star Johnny Depp. They started filming in September of 2000, but encountered a ton of issues, including F-16 aircraft disrupting the audio and a flash flood destroying their equipment, which wouldn't be covered by insurance. And this was just in the first two days. They also faced scheduling issues with many of the actors and had no idea when certain scenes would be filmed. Then, actor John Rochefort suffered from a herniated disc, which made riding on horseback impossible, leading to production being postponed until finally cancelled in November of 2000. There was even a 2002 documentary called Lost in La Mancha that covers his attempt at making the film. The next decade and a half saw Gilliam making a few more attempts at resurrecting the project, facing many setbacks and rejections. In 2006, he finally got the rights to be able to make it again, but Depp's busy schedule continued to delay things. And then in 2010, he finished casting for the film, but lost his source of funding. The film was being labeled as cursed by this point, which only deterred potential investors. In 2016, it finally went into production with Adam Driver as the lead, but a power-hungry and greedy producer caused issues by trying to reduce everyone's salary and gain total control of the film. So Gilliam found new producers and finally went on to finish the film. There weren't too many issues making the film this time, but it released to mediocre reviews, poor box office performance, and went through a whole legal ordeal with the original producer. And our final entry for the hardest film to make goes to 1959's Ben-Hur. But let's be honest, you could have picked any old epic for this spot. These films achieved pretty crazy things with practical effects alone. And perhaps the most iconic of these is the chariot race scene from Ben-Hur. The chariot arena was the largest film set ever constructed. Carved out of a rock quarry, this monumental set took a year and a thousand people to create, costing one million dollars. The chariot scene took almost a year to plan and five weeks to film. They trained 72 horses for the scene alone and hired 7,000 extras, most of them to be in the stands. Despite the challenges, including a near-death incident with a stuntman, it went far smoother than the 1925 version of Ben-Hur, where over 100 horses lost their lives while making the chariot scene. For the film, they had a team of 100 people dedicated to crafting costumes, while another 200 worked on creating statues and friezes. 15,000 sketches were made for every costume, set, and prop featured in the film. By the end of production, over 1 million props, 100,000 costumes, and 1,000 suits of armor were created. It's just mind-blowing. Filming itself took almost 8 months with 12 to 14 hour workdays, 6 days a week. The original $7 million budget increased to over $15 million by the end, making it the most expensive production of its time. But unlike Cleopatra, which faced similar budgetary issues, Ben-Hur triumphed at the box office. Audiences and critics loved it and it swept the Oscars, winning 11 awards. The film was remade again in 2016, but it was nowhere near as good as the first two. And those were another 11 of the hardest films to make. But before we finished, here's a bonus one. In our previous video, we mistakenly said that Russian Ark held the record for the longest single shot in a film. However, in 2015, the film Victoria surpassed it with its single 134 minute continuous shot. It took three attempts to achieve the shot, which weirdly enough is the same number of attempts that was needed for Russian Ark. With a script only 12 pages long, not only was it filmed in a single take, but most of the dialogue was improvised. And as a safety measure, they initially filmed a version consisting of 10 minute cuts to satisfy those funding the film before director Sebastian Schipper filmed the version he envisioned. So there you have it, 11 films we believe to be the hardest to make. Are there any others we missed that were even more difficult? Share your thoughts below. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe and check out our Patreon for some cool perks. But until next time, have a good one.